We're here expecting the unexpected, that we might have an encounter this morning with the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, the Son. So I'm going to encourage each and every one of us right now to just kind of get our hearts in line with the Father. Because, Father, our will for this morning is that you would have your way in your house and that we wouldn't get in the way of your Spirit doing his work in our hearts. So if you are able, I'm going to invite you to stand with us right now. Come down to the front. Press into the presence of the Father. Let us experience worship together as God's worshipers. our praise and that is our hope and our wish this morning that we could be set ablaze for the Father, that truly we would know that He is pursuing us. He is chasing us down in this world and He wants us to know how much He loves us. Thunder hides. Can I run? 
is one I'm tethered to. With every step, I collide with you. Like a tidal wave, crashing on. Romans 8, 38 to 39, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. The struggles that I face, the choices I have made, can't stop your love for me, can't stop your love. The darkness of the night, the scars I try to
Lord God, you deserve all of our praise this morning, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise. God, we realize that when we step outside of ourselves and we step into your presence, that we are truly connecting with you in the heart because you created us to worship you, God. So this morning, as we continue in our worship set, I just encourage all of us to find that space. Separate if you need, but get into the place where you can hear from the heart of God. I feel you so close to me. I can hardly move or breathe. Can I feel your presence all around? I fall knees down to the ground. 
opportunity, let your heart cry out to the Father. What are you struggling with? Let it go and tell him he is the one that matters. There is none like him in all the earth. And he loves each and every one of us. He has so much he sent his son, Jesus. invited you in. We had no idea of all the goodness that you were going to bring into our lives. We bring in Almighty God, who has that power to deal with whatever we're facing. In fact, you invite us to come into your sanctuary and bring our stuff, bring our anger and our lust and our greed and our you name it, bring it. That person that we're having troubles with, that situation we can't believe you've allowed to happen. Whatever it is, we bring it into the sanctuary and we push it into your presence because you're the one who can handle whatever we're facing. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth. There's more stars in the sky than there's sand on the seashore. That's how vast you are. And so, Lord God, we come to you knowing that you can make it happen, whatever it is we're looking for today. When you come into our lives, suddenly we have a confidence in the midst of our, our problems because, well, nothing can separate us from your love. And, and we like that in terms of eternity. We know that when we get to heaven, that because of what you've done for us, we get to live with you forever. But actually it applies now there's no situation that we can get into no sin that we can get caught in no problem that we face that you don't have the ability to conquer problem to solve relationship to reconcile you move in wonderful powerful ways and today we want to embrace that we want to bring that situation, that person, that inner problem and say, Lord, I need you to move. Move out the anger, the fear, the worries, the struggles. Move in your presence that reminds us that you are with us at all times. Move out all those bad attitudes and those selfish concerns and it's how disappointing that we can get so petty about minor issues and let important relationships get damaged over petty issues. Move it out, Lord, so that we're just filled with love and grace, that we don't bother counting slights and whatever's been brought against us. We're, we're too busy focused on experiencing and sharing you. We've come to experience you, Lord. Release the Holy Spirit afresh. Truly, fall afresh into our minds and change the way we see the world. Change the way we speak, the way we think. Turn awkward thoughts into prayers for others. Turn judgmental looks into compassionate gazes. Come and 
Transform us into people who move according to your Holy Spirit's prompting. We see the opportunity and we know that you're going to go with us, that you're going to speak through us, that we can release your touch. Let us have that kind of a mindset, that kind of a purpose, an intentionality when we get up. God is going to be guiding me today. And Lord, there's so many things we want to lift up to you. I lift up Matt Didway and the kids he just brought back from yet another camp. They had a powerful experience, and I want to pray for our preschoolers. I'm going to pray for our elementary schoolers, our middle schoolers, our senior hires. I'm going to pray that all of them, our college students, that they would be the next generation of Christians that you're raising up. And they're entering into an awkward world, so we're covering them with prayers. We're giving them to you and asking that you would not only bless and protect them, but that you'd use them to further your kingdom of love. Lord, we got missionaries in India and in Kenya and in Haiti. We got other missions down the street here in 192. We're asking that people would meet you. Last year, 46 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ at the Hope Center. Lord, we want that to just keep happening here and there and everywhere possible. Lord, and use our lives. May we have the boldness and the joy to speak to somebody in our social circle, bring up a conversation about you with a friend that we've never talked about you before. To have the courage to stand and say, no, you know what, actually I don't believe in what you're saying and here's why. And we do it with love but with so many people floundering and so many people struggling and people drifting away from you, Lord. Here am I, use me, as Isaiah said. Use us. We don't want to come and have a nice little worship service and go back to the same old. We want you to go with us, you to come inside of us, you to transform us, and you to reach through us. We don't want to play church, Lord. We want to be your people, filled with your presence. And we thank you for all the ways you bless and care and watch out for us. Lord, as we come into church today, we come from different places on the spiritual journey. Some of us are desperately needing you to move in our lives. We got financial issues. We're facing problems that we just can't fix. Lord, come to our aid. Guide us. Bring us to the right people. Fight for us, Lord. There's people that we care about drifting away from you. Hear our prayers and go grab them with your grip of grace and bring them back into a relationship with you. Many of us, we need a healing touch, an emotional healing, a relational healing, physical healing. Come, Lord. Lay your hand upon us. Revive us so that we can live aggressively for you. Just sharing our faith and stepping out in peace and joy and love. Lord, you know what's going on within us, so we take a quiet, personal moment now to speak to you. refreshing 
talk to you in your house, surrounded by the family, embracing the promises that you make over and over and over again, that you're for us, you're with us, we're safe in your grasp. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, let's stand and greet one another. All right, we got an exciting moment. We're baptizing Francesca Elizabeth Bonislawski. So come on forward and let's make it happen. This is exciting for me. I don't know, it feels like about, about a year and a half ago, Michael calls me up, hey, I'm getting married. I need some marriage counseling. I said, oh, I'd love to do it. <laughs> Who's marrying you? He goes, I don't know. I'd love to do it. And out of that, it's a beautiful relationship started, and this guy has just become really special to me. And this little one has been part of our Wednesday night Bible studies. Hi, beautiful. <laughs> you really are gorgeous. Thanks for letting her come to our Bible study. Yes, yeah. okay. <clears throat> Causes us to uh, clean up our act and, you know, <laughs> behave correctly because there's a woman in the room. But we're so excited to have you in our fellowship and so excited about this moment to, to baptize your little one. And I want you to hear the words of our Lord Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. You see, in Jesus Christ. God has promised to forgive our sins. And as he washes our sins away, well, he fills us with his Holy Spirit. And then, well, he connects us to the family, the church, which you're connected to and which you're bringing your little baby up to be under the same covering. So with this in mind and presenting Francesca for baptism, you're announcing your faith in Jesus and show that you want her to study him, know him, and love and serve Jesus Christ as a chosen disciple. So let me ask, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Do you trust in him? I do. Do you intend Francesca to be his disciple, obey his word, and show his love? We do. Very well. Congregation, our Lord ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of this church, promise to tell this little angel the good news of the gospel and help her know all that Christ commands and by your fellowship? Strengthen her family ties with the household of God. If so, answer, we do. Amen. Godparents, please rise. <laughs> do you promise to be committed to the spiritual and total well-being of Francesca Elizabeth Monoslowski? Yeah. Very well, then. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope that we have in your son Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with the Holy Spirit so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Do you want to hold her or do you want me to hold her? You hold her. Hi, That's sweetheart. Her, right? Can I hold you? <laughs> Actually, I've rocked her in my seat. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, little one. Oh, Aww. come on, huh? <laughs> Doesn't get better than this. Aww. Well, it does get better because you know why? We're going to baptize you. Okay? Mm hmm. So, Francesca Elizabeth Bonislavski. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I pray that every step you take would be with God's hand guiding you. And everywhere you go, you'd have him looking out for you. And that every stage of your life, that the Spirit of God would be influencing you and caring for you, picking out your mate, your career, your job, your college, always blessing you. So I bring you into the family of Jesus Christ and ask that the Holy Spirit rests upon you now all the way into forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 says, has she been baptized? Show her this. Okay. Amen. Well, that's impossible to follow up. <laughs> My name is Matt. I'm the youth director here at Comprez. And this summer has been absolutely amazing. I, had to get, I got to go on a, a vacation, got to go to middle school camp, high school camp, and we just finished up an amazing missions trip down, a local missions trip for a week. And as much as, as, much as God moves in each one of those situations, and I promise you, God has moved in the life of our youth ministry, it is good to be home. It is good to be back at my home church with my church family. And this morning, if you're new and you think that this might be a, a, a home for you, a church family that you can be a part of, we just want to encourage you to either find our church app in your app store. Um, all you got to do is type in Compress Church, and that's a one-stop shop of everything you want to know about us. And there's also a newcomer's um, option that you can fill out with announcements and ways to give and different things like that. Um, but also, if this is your church home and you are a part of our church family, uh, I just want to encourage you to grab the friendship pad out of the uh, aisle, on the inside part of the aisle, and you can go ahead and pass that down as well. Because of our special moment that we had this morning, I'm not going to go over the announcements, so I just want to encourage you to look through your bulletin. Everything you need to know is there. Thank you, and God bless. Thanks, Thank you, Matt. I want to remind you that... Uh, God loves you, and when he makes you part of his family, you got family chores, and one of those family chores is caring about other people, sharing our faith, uh, building other broken people back up into wholeness, reaching out and finding lost souls and, 
and giving them their dignity back, reminding them of their identity as the children of God. We've got so many ministries aimed at the youth, at, at, at people that we don't even know, folks that are surrounding us and broken, uh, the family. And we make it all happen because of the way you, well, give to the church, give to the Lord, release your blessings that he's given to you and put them into motion so that God will take your resources and turn them into eternal gems. That's why we give. That's why we circulate the offering plates. Friends, that's why we live, so that God might move to us, so he'll move through us. Amen. Just take a quick moment, if you will, and, and close your eyes, and I want you to listen for a moment. And imagine that we are at the foot of the mountain in the desert with the Israelites and Moses, and it's that very moment when God himself is coming down to his people. The first offering, there was thunder, lightning lit up the skies. God was offering himself to his people, and his people, they were afraid. But Moses, he heard the booming voice of the Lord, and he responded by stepping into the clouds, into God's glory. So this morning, this is our opportunity to step into his presence and give back to him all he's given to us. I see the cloud. Step in journey through the Sermon on the Mount. Last week we talked about murder, adultery, and divorce. And today, an eye for an eye. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. 
And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I don't mind telling you that an eye for an eye is something that I have struggled with all of my life. You see, I grew up in a rough part of Los Angeles, kind of a gang-infested neighborhood, and so I often had to fight just to keep my lunch money or just to go from school back home or wherever I was going. And at the same time, I was trying to be a Christian, and so it was an awkward dichotomy that I had to live in. And for me, my next-door neighbor was a professional boxer. So I learned how to box. He taught me how to fight. He made me a boxer. In fact, I was <clears throat> 17 and one, okay? And, and the thing about boxing is fast hands, you know, that, that's, that's the real skill. And, and I had that, and I remember one time this guy pulls a knife on me to rob me, and I snuck the knife right out of his hand, you know? And he stood there stunned, and I pulled out my wallet and said, I'll give this to you in the name of Jesus, okay? I thought I was pretty cool, but I didn't always handle things correctly. I remember one time I was at the beach, and, you know, I'm lost in worship, and I'm praising, and I'm praying, and all of a sudden I get interrupted by these three guys who are robbing me. Give us your money. And so, you know, what a rude awakening. You go from praise to reality, and I'm like, gentlemen, I'm on the beach. I don't have anything. So as they turn to go away, the old self arose. And by the way, if I did... I don't think the three of you could take it from me. I'm like, oh, you know, here I am in praise and worship, and the old self has to come into play. And and maybe you know that experience, you know, you're deep in prayer, and somebody comes to mind, and the next thing you know, you're in combat, and you're all upset and angry. Well, Jesus comes along and says, an eye for an eye, no, turn the other cheek. Don't resist evil. And I want to say, I I doubt that he was turning this into a law. Uh, We tend to do that with religious teachings. You know, somebody makes a statement and we make it the rules. Well, actually, a a wife's not supposed to put up with physical abuse. We're not supposed to stand by and watch a child get victimized. It's okay to lock your doors and try to keep your stuff so that other people don't take them. No, what Jesus is talking about here is a state of heart. And, And really, he's illustrating to his new disciples what it means to follow him by pointing to issues of their day. For instance, don't get revenge. You have to know this is a hot-headed group of people. Right at the moment, they are infiltrated by the Roman society, and so there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of issues going on. And, And let's be honest, all of us have the desire to get even with somebody. We want to get revenge. We want to pay them back. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or how about a few teeth for a tooth, huh? That makes us a little happier. Uh, I remember reading about this one man. He went to the mall, and when he got out to park his car, he smelled this foul odor. And so he opened up the hood, and sadly, an animal had, you know, gotten into the hood and rested on the engine and died. And so, well, he goes to the trunk. He gets out a bag. He puts the animal in a bag, he sets it down, and then he goes back to the trunk to put things away, and he notices this woman comes along, looks both ways, grabs the bag, and runs into the mall. (laughs) So he goes, I'm going to follow her, see what this is all about. (laughs) So he follows her in, and she goes into this restaurant, she sits down at a booth, and she opens up the bag and shrieks, knocks her head on the booth, unconscious. Okay. So they call the paramedics, and the ambulance comes, and they revive her, and they put her on a stretcher, and they're going to take her to the hospital. And just as they're putting her in, he says, wait a minute, she forgot her bag, and tosses it in as the doors close. (laughs) And we like this story because she gets what she deserves. And this concept of an eye for an eye, it's found in Exodus 21 and Leviticus 24 and Deuteronomy 19. It's called the, 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 the lex talionis, the law of retaliation. And you have to understand that before this, it was the law of the jungle. If you hurt my child, I kill you, okay? Uh, you, you say something that I don't like, I, I slaughter your entire village, okay? It, it was a way out of, it was a 
time in history where violence and injustice was the norm. And so an eye for an eye was a dramatic leap for civilization. It was a very humane law at the time. And by the way, an eye for an eye wasn't carried out by a private individual. No, there was a court system involved, and they would literally do it with a monetary fine. They wouldn't poke out somebody else's eye. Uh, the Jewish Mishnah, they, they would say, if anybody wounds his fellow, he becomes liable to compensation for the injured party. Damage, pain, healing, loss of times from work, insult, defamation of character is what, is what we would say today. And so Jesus comes along, and he says, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, offer them the left. And, and this is really important to know because the left hand was the unclean hand. It's the one you used for bathroom issues. And, and so Jesus is saying, you've been insulted. And, and, and I don't want you to worry about this. In fact, go ahead and invite more insult. It's, I don't want you to retaliate. And this is huge, okay? This is the context. The Greek word is an open hand slap. And, and, and how many of us have been insulted? I'm guessing 100% of you. And, and isn't it amazing how that insult can travel with you throughout the rest of the day and month and year and decades? You know, we hold on to this kind of stuff. When Jesus is talking about how to handle an insult, it's not a minor issue because it can actually be something that we never let go of. In fact, this whole section is addressing the way we deal with personal confrontations. When someone strikes you, when someone sues you, when someone forces you. And the Lord doesn't want us to retaliate. Actually, he calls us to pay back evil with good. And hear me, this is the opposite of being passive. I'm just going to let it go. No, it's actively pursuing doing good to somebody who has insulted you, who's hurt you. We look for ways to bless our enemies. Uh, Luke 6, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Okay, this isn't passive. You're not a pushover, you're not a doormat. You take charge of whatever situation and person it is and decide to bring God's mercy. Try to apply God's heart. And we step back and go, wait a minute, <clears throat> I think God's asking for the impossible here? Well, yeah, he is. It goes against our natural human nature, okay? But here's the deal. With man, it is impossible. But all things are possible with God. You know, we might not be able to hand over an insult or something negative done to us, but when the Holy Spirit is allowed access into our heads and hearts, suddenly he starts telling you how to live. He starts suggesting the way to handle a problem person in a difficult situation. When we surrender control of our lives to him, suddenly we are operating according to the ways of God. And really, there's lots of ways of dealing with insults and, and negative stuff. Some people get real aggressive, and if you criticize them, they criticize you back. If you insult them, they insult you back. They're, they're, they're really confrontational. And then there's the passive-aggressive kind. They pretend like it's no big deal, but then they go around behind the scenes and, and get even with you. Reminds me of the trucker who stopped off to get a meal, and he's ordered his hamburger fries and, and, and drink, and three bikers come in, and they focus their attention on the trucker. And they walk over and say, oh, you're going to eat this hamburger? And pick it up and start eating this hamburger. Another one grabs his fries. Are you going to eat these fries? The other one grabs his drink. You're going to eat this drink? So the trucker just gets up, pays his bill, walks out. And the bikers say to the waitress, boy, he wasn't much of a man. And she says, no, he wasn't. And he wasn't much of a driver either because I noticed he knocked over three motorcycles when he left. <laughs> You know, some folks, they're simply passive, and they allow others to walk all over them. And, and friends, that's not what Christianity is about. It actually means doing good to those who are set against you. It's an intentional decision. The goal is reconciliation. As far as it depends on you, you do all you can to bring Jesus to that person and to this situation. If they receive it or not, it's not on you. 
you've obeyed the Lord. And really, God is our creator. He knows what's best for us. He knows that revenge is just going to fill our hearts with bitterness and, and it's like pouring a drink of poison for somebody else and then you drinking it. I read a story in the Newsweek about uh, the, the sniper's tale. It's about a Sarajevo man named Pipo. He used to run a, a, a restaurant, and then the Muslims got his mother, and they put her in jail, and they tortured her. And then when she was released, she was so traumatized, he decided to go on a killing spree. And when I say killing spree, he killed 325 Muslims, Okay. This is what happened to him. He says, I was changed. All I know how to do now is kill. I'm not normal anymore. I don't have any emotion. Somebody pushes me, I kill him. I didn't care about anything. All feelings are gone. And here's what happened. You see, he became exactly like the people he hated. And when hate is our focus, we become absorbed with hate. And I wonder how many of us have let some person from the past dictate our forward motion in life, interfere with our Christianity, determine our destiny, because we never handed them over to God. Yes, they did us wrong. Yes, it was a horrible situation. They should have never said that. They should have never moved against us like that, but they did. And we've kept that alive, and we come in, and we're willing to give God I surrender almost everything. I'll not surrender that, though. Okay? And our sting continues to sting us. And, and you know what? This is what the Bible says. Focus on Jesus, and you're going to become like Jesus. You're going to become forgiving. You're going to become compassionate. You're going to be full of love. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Eyes on Jesus, giving it to him, knowing that he's now going to be moving on your behalf, within you and around you. Dallas Willard in The Divine Conspiracy, he sheds light on this. We're seeing life from the point of view of eternity. You know, we know we're going to be taken care of no matter what. But we can be vulnerable because we are, in the end, invulnerable. You know, we are in the grasp of God. And friends, when the Lord gets involved, when you make a decision for him, he does get involved. And suddenly, he's moving for you. This one couple, they had somebody in their business extort $27,000 from them. And so this was a big issue and a big problem for them. And so they went to the pastor and said, what should we do? And the pastor said, I'll tell you what you should do. Find out a need that that person has and meet it. And they knew that this person had to move out of their house, and so they found out where he was moving, and they paid his first and last rent, and $3,000 invested in that person who stole the money from him. And they went home and slept peacefully. And this is what they said. We noticed from that point on, God blessed our business tremendously. Amen. You see, you bring God into your situation, and he notices and really, as Christians, we believe God's in control. Even when bad things happen, he takes bad things and he turns them into, uh, you know, opportunities for good. You know, something goes wrong and we, we follow the Lord's will. And the next thing you know, people are getting touched and blessed, including you. We're under the watchful care of the Heavenly Father. Well, we don't have to defend ourselves because we know he's going to fight for us. You know, Psalm 121, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you doesn't sleep or slumber. His eye is on you all the time. And that means we're to live in a way that provides people an opportunity to see who God is. Okay, we don't have to fight for our own rights. We're more concerned about people seeing the gracious nature of God. Because God's going to fight for our rights. You know, we're more concerned with showing the generous love of God than being treated the way we ought to be treated, because it's not about us. Our lives are all about God living out his plan for the world through us. God living out his plan for the world through us. And the Lord gives us the strength to do it through his Holy Spirit. He shows us how to do it through Jesus. You know, in Isaiah 53, 3, 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, 
but was silent before his shearers. Isaiah 50, verse 6, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. This is how Jesus dealt with being tortured and crucified. And he, he shows us how we can take the slights and the negative things that happen to us and bring God into that moment, and suddenly we become avenues of transformation and resurrection in other people's lives. Do you understand that you wear Christ's label, that you represent God in the world, that you release the presence of God to the people around you? Does that sound like your lifestyle? Because it's important for people to see the grace of God in our lives. I mean, we can strike back verbally, you know, physically, legally, financially, but are people going to see Jesus through our actions? Okay? Sometimes we have to understand well, that's a non-Christian or that's a broken person and hurt people hurt people. And we have to give them the space to, 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 to fall on their faces and make the mistakes. And we're not concerned about that. We're concerned about the healing love of Jesus Christ resting upon that person. And I'll tell you something really fascinating. When you and I start praying for that person who hurts us and asking God to show his grace to them, suddenly they move from being this person that we want punished to this person that we have compassion for. It's as if when we bring God's love to the situation, suddenly his love floods our hearts and changes our worldview. Well... Nothing hurts more than being sued and having to go through the legal system, right? Well, what do we call it, the injustice system? And when Jesus says, if somebody tries to take your tunic, give them your cloak as well, basically what he's saying is, as Christians, we need to value people more than possessions. You know, the cloak was the outer garment. In fact, in the Old Testament, God said, you can sue somebody, but you can't take their cloak because that's what they slept in at night. That was their main covering. They needed that or else they would be vulnerable. And when you took somebody's cloak for the day, it gave that person and you an opportunity to figure out how you're going to be repaid because you know you have to give it back to them and they know, well, they want it back from you. It was a really beautiful format that, that God created. And really, friends, we're to be more concerned about relationships than material possessions. Okay? It's better to take the loss and stay on good terms with somebody than to prove your case and win the point, but lose the chance to show God's generous nature. Now, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, better to be taken advantage of than bring shame to Jesus. You know? And we'll fight over a small slight, and really we need to just push it aside and, and let Jesus cover us, because you know that he will. When we forgo our rights so that Jesus gets his way, guess what? You know, all goodness is released. Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness, and all these things are added unto you. It's a funny thing. If you live for the reward, you don't get the reward. If you live for the relationship with Jesus, the rewards are numerous. And really for us, it's important to hear this. We shouldn't allow material things to get in our way of our witness for Christ. I mean, how many times do... We prioritize, well, you know, I, 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 I could give this person money, but, you know, I have to save it for the trip that I'm going on. I, I could bless this person, but actually it's going to be inconvenient for me. There's so many different times when the opportunity is available, and yet, well, we decide against it. And I want you to hear me. Sometimes following Jesus is going to cost us material possessions. Sometimes it's going to cost us the loss of property. But we're losing it for Jesus' sake. And when we're losing it for Jesus' sake, God gets involved, and he's proud of you, and he's going to move for you. Well, let's move to the last thing, Romans. The Romans had a law that said soldiers could appoint any non-Roman citizen to carry their pack for one mile. Okay, that was the law. The Jews hated it. You can be doing your own thing, and hey, you, carry this pack for, for a mile. And they had mile markers all over the, the, the roads. In fact, um, they had mile markers pointing to Rome on every road. That's why there's the statement, all roads lead to Rome. Okay? And Jesus takes this controversial, repulsive law, and he turns it into a new starting point for human relationships. That we're to respond to humiliating situations by doing extra. Go the extra mile. 
This is what he's talking about. And you and I think, well, you know, I, I might go the extra mile for a family member or a good friend, but, but not for an enemy. But here's the thing. What's going to reflect the heart of God more? You know, somebody who's reluctant and, and, and spiteful because you have to do this thing that's been asked of you? Or going with a cheerful, willing, gracious heart, willing to go above and beyond the call of duty, demonstrating the heart and love of God. And I have to tell you, the second mile, it's not an easy trip. You know, if you don't bring Jesus with you, it's no fun. First of all, it's not a crowded road because most people don't go the second mile. And there's lots of landmines on the second mile. People are going to take pot shots at you. They're going to always demand more from you. Satan's going to try to get you off the second mile. He'll use your family, your friends, your fears to say, oh, you don't have to do that. That's inconvenient. Okay? You shouldn't have to do that. Your rights and your comfort are being squandered here. And when we hear that, you know, in our consumer mentality, we're like, hey, well, what's in it for me? If nothing's in it for me, I don't want to do this. And we got people always criticizing us. You know, why do you go to church all the time? Why are you always reading your Bible? People complaining and discouraging and pointing fingers. We go the second mile. And it's sad how many people in our society don't even go the first mile. It's only concerned about what's in it for me. Okay, so many people who, who can't be bothered to care for others, and they have no interest in God or the church. And I find it fascinating. We have a man who's dying right now in our congregation. And he comes to church every Sunday. And you can see the pain. And you can tell how difficult it was for him to get here. But for him, he needs to be in the presence of God. I'm talking to him the other Sunday. Then I run into one of my friends. I go, hey, man, did you go to church? No, you know, I was feeling kind of tired. I'm like, wait a minute, this guy's dying, and you got a hangnail, okay? I mean, this seems to be, you know, that second effort. How many times did we do something that we don't want to do, and then God shows up, and we're so glad that we did it, and it wasn't convenient, and we didn't feel like it, and yet we made the effort, and God blesses us. You know, it reminds me of that one woman, <clears throat> she had a condition. Every Sunday, she just had this condition, couldn't go to church, you know. Only happened on Sunday mornings, you know. And uh, she couldn't go, and her husband always went to church, but, you know. Uh, well, one day, a friend of hers came alongside and said, hey, uh, who was that pretty, sophisticated lady sitting next to your husband in church? And the miraculous occurred. <laughs> Suddenly, she was healed. You know what's really cool about our passage here? Jesus doesn't mention any Roman soldiers when he talks about going the second mile. He says, whosoever compels you, could be a coworker, a neighbor, a stranger, an enemy, whoever it is that asks something of you, give what we can bring to them. You know, Jesus, he was compelled to walk the Via De La Rosa to the cross. He's already shown us how to make this journey. And the second mile, it means carrying somebody else's burdens. And it's exhausting unless you've been refreshed and filled by the Holy Spirit, okay? Like Jesus, he said, I have food you do not know of, so do we. We have access to the presence of God that can make us get through any situation we face. You know, the Coast Guard was summoned on a stormy night to rescue survivors from a sh sinking ship, and one of the crew was fearful. He said, Captain, we'll never get back. He says, our orders are to go, not to come back. And really, friends, the same for us. There are people out there that we need to bridge God to, and we can't worry about slights. There are people out there who are all upset about stuff, and we, we have to care about their souls. There are people who are so demanding, and we have to get into a relationship with them so that we can make Jesus accessible. And when that's the motive to what, how we live all the time, the Holy Spirit is on the move. It's just the way it is. And here's the cool thing about it. When we go, who promises to go with us? Jesus. I will never leave you or forsake you. Over and over and over, God says, I will be with you. You know, I had a cool experience. I saw an old friend that I, you know, hadn't seen in decades. And I go, hey, man, you, you still walking with the Lord? And he goes, I'm on the second mile. I thought it was so cool. 
You know, here's a guy who, who explains his faith in the sense that I, I've matured, my faith has developed. I'm at that place where it's not about me, it's about how I could be a blessing to others. And by the way, friends, the second mile, it doesn't have an ending. It just keeps going and going until one day you're called to heaven when we have fought the good fight and we've finished the course. You know, when I was in Ireland, <clears throat> they have these really cool graveyards all over the place, right? So I'd be driving along with my daughter and I'd see a graveyard. <clears throat> I go, let's go find the oldest grave we can, you know? So we're stomping on graves and, you know, Oh, this O'Leary, you know, 1888, you know, O'Malley, 1828, you know, somebody from 17-something, but, well, you know, the time and the elements had made it so that you couldn't read many of the gravestones anymore. My daughter said, Dad, do you think anybody knows who these people are? I said, yeah, I know somebody who knows who every one of them is, their creator, God. He doesn't forget anybody. In fact, he's got our names recorded in the book of life. Friends, Jesus has secured for each one of us an eternal home. But it isn't just about then. It's about now. He's available now to help us have the right attitude, God's attitude. He's available to help us get through that second mile where we live for him and with him and watch him do the incredible things that, that we read about in the Bible. And we follow the Lord not for recognition, just because we want to please him, just because we live to bridge Jesus to everybody else who crosses our path. Paul's put in prison unjustly. So what does he do? Complain? No. Turns it into a pulpit and saves all kinds of people. He shows us this is how we're supposed to live. When you're all consumed with your personal interests, you're going to cut off living for the interests of God. And friends, I guess the question of the morning is how willing are you, how far are you willing to go with Jesus? Okay? I mean, in this world right now, they don't see Jesus except for those second mile Christians, and they go, wow, what's up with that person? Oh, they're one of those Christians. They go, that's a lot different than the world that I've grown up in. And, you know, I, we have to ask ourselves, are we more concerned with receiving proper treatment, being respected, or showing the grace of Jesus Christ to people? Changes the way you do relationships. Now, if you're willing to take on an insult so that you might release a blessing, God's going to see that and move on that. And do you value people more than possessions? This is a big one for us Americans. You know, we live for our possessions. And yet there's so many people out there that don't know Jesus, and they have possessions, and they live empty, broken lives. And maybe we can show that actually it's not about possessions. It's about this relationship that impacts these relationships. I guess what I want to ask, are you willing to go beyond what's expected? In fact, this morning, there might be somebody in your life that you need to reframe they insulted you. You're never going to forgive them. Maybe this is the time to reconsider. And really, the serious question is this. When you get up every morning, are you living with and for Jesus? Or do you want Jesus to help bless your agenda? Are you living to see how you might spread his love, his presence, his word? Because that's how we're supposed